My name is Belen Marquez from the National Life Science Institute Europe, and I will be introducing today's webinar. We have just a few housekeeping items before we begin. For best viewing of the presentation material, please click on Maximize in the upper right corner of the slide window, then restore to return to normal view. Audio is being transmitted over the computer, so please have your speakers on and volume turned up in order to hear. A telephone connection is not available. Questions should be submitted to the presenters during the presentation via the Q&A section at the right of the screen. It is important to note that all opinions and statements are those of the individual making the presentation and not necessarily the opinion or view of ILC Europe and IFP. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for access by IFP members within one week and will be openly accessible via ILC Europe's website. We would like to warmly welcome you to the webinar on assessment of microbial risk for fresh produce organized by International Life Science Institute Europe and International Association for Food Protection, AAFP. We are happy to see that many of you wanted to join us. After a brief introduction of the organizing affiliation, this webinar will be followed by three short presentations with some time for questions and answers at the end. I'm Belen Marquez, Scientific Project Manager at ILC Europe, that is a non-profit organization that builds multi-stakeholder science-based solutions for a sustainable and healthier world. ILC Europe has a wide network with highly renewed voluntary scientists that discuss scientific issues of public interest. ILC Europe is a non-profit organization with a tripartite nature with very strict policy that we do not lobby and we do not discuss marketing and pricing. This again highlights the fact that we are a purely science-driven organization. More specifically, this webinar is organized by ILC Europe Microbiolog Microbiological Food Safety Task Force. Their main aim is to investigate microbial issues in food that are related to public health risks. Current activity activities of the task force are related to industrial microbiological risk assessment, virus control options in food processing, the use of next generation sequencing in microbiological food safety, and antimicrobial resistance. The International Association of Food Protection has more than 4,000 uh, food safety professionals as members, and their main goal is to advance food safety worldwide. ILC Europe and IFP has a long-term collaboration in the organization of the European Food Safety Conference. IFP is particularly appreciated for their annual meeting, next year to be organized in Salt Lake City, Utah, in July, and the European Symposium of Fit on Food Safety to be held on April in Stockholm. We hope to see you all there. Now I would like to give the word to Professor Switering, who will be moderating this webinar and will introduce the speakers of today. Okay, thank you very much, Belen, and also good morning and good afternoon and good evening for all the participants of this webinar. And like Belen was saying, uh, I'm moderating this session. That means that I'm presenting the speakers, and also I will organize the questions uh, that you can pose. Uh, if you have questions, then please enter them in the question and answer box and uh, then submit them, and I will look at them and try to organize them for the end of the webinar. So after the three presentation, there will be the uh, answering of the questions. Um, so, um, as you have seen already the, the program, we uh, are now working with the welcome and the practical announcement, and the webinar will uh, contain three presentations, like Bellen already mentioned, one by Jim Monohan, who will tell about the risk assessment or assessment of the risk, that's the question, that will be followed by Roy Betts about risk assessment for fresh produce issues faced with putting formal risk assessments in industrial practice in the field, and then followed by Michel Danulac uh, on assessment of risk for fresh produce, mitigating risk in the field. And like I mentioned, after that, there's the question and answer session. So please uh, also do not forget to pose questions. I would not like to have only two questions, but also please don't send 250, because that will also be difficult to manage. But OK, send me 250 and I will manage. 
So since it is a webinar, we also included uh, the photos because then you know a little bit who is speaking to you. So you've seen already the photo of Bill and, and my photo. Uh, but uh, here you can see the photos and the contact information of Jim, Roy, and Michelle. Also at the end of the presentation, we will come again with this uh, slide so that you can see the photos, the names, and the email addresses. And like Bill already mentioned, also the webinar is recorded. And you can also later on uh, look at the webinar and, for instance, pause at this slide to uh, type the email address if you want to contact one of the presenters. So the first presentation uh, will uh, be uh, given by uh, Jim Monahon. And uh, Jim has worked on crop science for over 20 years. I'm not going to read his whole CV again. You can read that later uh, in, the, um, in the recordings. But he's uh, currently uh, leading the Fresh Produce Research Center at the Harper Adams University. And he will give today the presentation, Risk Assessment or Assessment of the Risk. That's the question. So I now give the floor or the computer, you could say, to Jim. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. So risk assessment or assessment of risk, that's the question we're addressing today. So what's the challenge with fresh produce? We know fresh produce is great for health, and there's loads of positive messages about eating fresh produce, but also foodborne illness linked to fresh produce does occur. And when that happens, we can get bad press associated with fresh produce. Here's a number of examples from the UK. So food poisoning, warning over fruit and veg. Um, when fruit and vegetables are bad for you, getting your five a day is responsible for half of all food poisoning cases, and salad is more dangerous than beef burgers. This is not good news when we're trying to sell fresh produce. But there are commercial consequences. There was a large uh, VTEC outbreak linked initially, people thought, to fresh produce in Germany in 2011. Uh, subsequently, it was found to be linked to spouted seeds. But food sales of fresh produce really fell. And here's a great picture of celery and lettuce being returned to the field mm -hmm. unsold. And the EC ended up having to support the sector by over 200 million euros. So what are the hazards linked to fresh produce production? Well, the real challenge for us is that fresh produce is often grown in uncontrolled environments. And that means that there, there are risks taking place. And I've got a few examples to talk about here. In the top left, you'll see a brown pile. That's actually composted chicken manure. And that's next to a field of um, uncooked, so fresh produce that's going to be consumed uncooked. It's actually a leafy crop. But you'll be able to see, it's not a, a very big picture, but you'll see there's a pool of water next to it. And if that water was either taken into the field by a vehicle or it ran into the field, that could pose a direct contamination risk. Next to it, we've got a picture of some dairy cattle. Now, dairy cattle are great. They produce quite a lot of manure, quite a lot of feces, maybe up to 60 litres each. So that, again, come into direct contact with crops and the growing environment. In this case, they're even going through a stream. Is that stream leading into a water source that might be used for irrigation? Then the next picture here, we've got, again, uh, another interesting let's see if I can, um, uh, channel here. This is an irrigation ditch, and in it, uh, let me tell you, there's fertilizer, there's pesticide containers, there's drinks containers. There's even, for those of you who are really sharp-eyed, a rat that's drowned. But it is an irrigation ditch. Would you drink it? Should you irrigation crop, uh, irrigate a crop with it? Underneath is a great example of a, a mobile toilet, a, a port a loom. Um, here's a, a, a really nice setup. We've got baby leaf being harvested in the field. The crew are able to get to the loom. And when they come out, they're able to wash their hands with soap and water and dry them. And that's going to minimize the risk of, of contaminating crop having been to the, the loo. They have a seagull there, a bird, real challenge in outdoor crop production. They produce small amounts of feces, are very difficult to stop getting into field crops. And every now and then, you might see large numbers of them in a crop. And my final picture is actually an iceberg lettuce harvesting rig. Um, this is actually quite a good setup in the States, but you can see those work surfaces. If they become contaminated, they're actually going to pose a cross-contamination risk to subsequent lettuces being handled. 
In 2013, EFSA did a study where they looked at the pathogens and the crops which were important to consider in this area. And a number of pathogens came up, but salmonella came up a lot, along with pathogenic E. coli, norovirus, shigella, and a few others. But what are the, the crops we want to be thinking about? Well, uh, sprouted seeds, of course, is something we must think about, particularly we think about that VTEC outbreak in 2011. But melons come up. You'd think maybe listeria, but actually that was associated with salmonella. Tomatoes, too, associated with salmonella. We had bulb and stem veg, but the number one, uh, the first ranking was leafy greens with salmonella. So that's where our focus has got to be. So let's cook everything. Cooking kills bugs, no problem. But consumers like to eat products uncooked. And let's face it, if you boil your lettuce, it's not so crunchy. So then we're stuck with producing crops that are eaten uncooked with few or no true critical control points in the field where we can eliminate hazards or reduce them to an acceptable level. So the approach growers are being asked or required to follow are risk assessments. Here's an example of a, a risk assessment approach. This is what Global Gap requires their growers to do. It's five steps. Step one is identify the hazard. Step two, decide who or what might be harmed and how. Step three, evaluate the risks and decide on precautions. Step four, record the work plan findings and implement them. And step five, review the assessment and update if necessary. If you remove the last two as sort of procedural, you're left with three steps. But is this risk assessment as we define it by Codex? Because Codex would say risk assessment is, a, is one of the three components of risk analysis, and that risk assessment consists of four steps. Hazard identification, hazard characterization, exposure assessment, and risk characterization. And if we try to translate that terminology into what growers are doing, well, there is a hazard ID, but it's a generic risk of fecal contamination. Growers are not generally considering different pathogens separately. They put them all together. The exposure assessment is, is a, a calculation of is it probable or possible that microbial contamination on the product could lead to illness in a consumer. And then they decide on the precaution. So what system or process needs to be put in place to reduce the risk of contaminated product? But actually, that step could be seen almost as two stages. It's what's the intervention, so an assessment of the intervention, and then an assessment of exposure following an intervention. So how can we use evidence to justify qualitative decisions? A lot of the decisions growers are taking are, is it a bit better? Have I reduced the risk a bit more? So we're relying best practice, and we're relying on experts giving qualitative opinions. There is quantitative monitoring, and particularly we'll see uh, monitoring for generic E. coli, but uh, there is a challenge of whether growers are using that in a tick box approach, where they're complying with what's being asked of them, or whether they're using it as a dynamic monitoring process where they're actually um, quantifying whether their interventions are effective. We like academic papers, but often they're rarely suited, or often they are not suited to use by the industry. And there are a few direct scientific studies that look at the effect of multiple interventions where we're actually layering different interventions along the supply chain in the process of producing crops. We don't really know how they work together. So grow relevant evidence is needed for better risk assessment. And that's what we, as a group working for ILC, try to put together. So over to you, Marcel. OK, thank you very much, uh, Jim, uh, for this presentation. And I would like to remind, remind the audience that they can post questions. Uh, we have had some technical questions, but not yet content questions. So please, uh, maybe otherwise you'll forget what uh, Jim has been telling or what Roy is going to tell. So please, if you have them, type them in the question and answer box. So the next speaker will be uh, Roy Betts, and he is the head of micro microbiology at Camden BRI, an uh, independent food research organization based in the UK.
And Roy is also a member of a lot of uh, committees, and one of them is that he is scientific advisor of the ILSI Europe Microbiological Food Safety Task Force, and that is also the reason uh, uh, that he was in this expert committee. And also uh, Jim was in this expert committee that uh, uh, did together did uh, do an investigation, did write a paper on this, and that was the basis of this webinar. And after that, we invited also the third speaker. But uh, now I give the floor to Roy to go more into detail and uh, further the um, presentation that uh, Jim started with. Thank you, Marcel, and uh, and uh, hello to everyone on the line. Um, my my role today is to take uh, Jim's presentation forward slightly to talk more about what we did within the ILC Europe Food Safety Task Force uh, when we looked at, at risk assessment in fresh produce. Um, go on to the next slide. Um, the objective of the, of the ILC Europe group um, was to look at uh, the potential uh, for a grower-based risk assessment approach um, that was based on a form of a structured uh, qualitative, qualitative risk assessment um, with decisions being based on good evidence that could be documented and was transparent. And because we could document them and they were, they were able to be there for review, could be therefore challenged and defendable, and people could understand why particular decisions had been made in doing the risk assessment. So that was a challenge we faced. And when I think we looked at this in the beginning, um, what, we, what we did as a team was uh, thought, well, let's, let's imagine ourselves being the primary producer of a fresh produce, and we picked leafy greens uh, as an example. Um, and in that situation, it's your job to plant, grow, and harvest leafy greens and then supply them to a further processor, uh, who will then process them and supply them on to, to uh, further organizations. The important thing in that is that once you have supplied the product onwards to the further processor, it's outside of your control. Therefore, the only thing you can control from the point of view of, of microbiological risk is what is in your job, which is the planting, growing, and harvesting of leafy greens. So that's the only area really you have control of and the area that, that the risk assessment that you would do apply to. You're going to be asked to do a microbiological risk assessment by somebody, um, a supplier, a regulatory authority, and whatever it is. You have no specialist microbiological knowledge yourself. You have a minimal access to experts. You have limited previous information and data, maybe a small amount. So what is it you can do to answer this need for a risk assessment? And the way forward, um, started to be described by Jim in the, in the previous presentation, which is the approach of doing a grower MRI, a grower microbiological risk assessment. And that we, we propose would be a defined approach to doing an MRI. It can be done at the field grower level, so just the part of the process that's in your control. It should be simple, it should be effective, effective and of course it, it should be able to be documented so anyone in the future can see why particular decisions have been made. And going through the, the individual parts of, of what that was, again, Jim's touched on this as, as he went through, and I'm going to go on, on to uh, onto this in more detail. And each of the four bullet points you see on this slide, I'm going to expand in, in slides, the next slides as I go forwards. The things you can do is identify the hazard. But you can do that at a basic level. You don't know, need to go into excessive detail about what the hazard actually is. But by simple means, you can identify a range of potential pathogens that may be present from available literature sources. And that could be on the internet and, and so on very easily. Second bullet is the exposure assessment. That you could do qualitatively. Um, an assessment that contamination of a, a, a particular amount occurred or didn't occur. And you could do that with, with information. I'll, I'll show how that can be done in, in another slide. The intervention assessment. Now, assuming that you identify that a hazard could be there in, in a significant amount, you'd be considering interventions. And the intervention assessment is really how likely is any intervention you make likely to reduce the level of contamination. And the fourth point is, is linked to that, which is an exposure assessment following the intervention. So once you've looked at the intervention, you then go back and say, well, if I impose that intervention, will my, uh, my contamination level of the hazard reduce by a particular amount? 
with that or further steps. So it's looking at whether I have a hazard there, whether it's a significant level, what are my interventions are going to be, and whether the intervention has a great effect or not. And we'll go through those one by one as we go through it. Hazard identification um, could be quite a simple approach, simply as done in, in a HACCP procedure. Um, using available lichen sources, um, we could easily look at leafy salads and say that we've certainly got issues with salmonella, with E. coli 0157 and maybe other FTEX, with norovirus, perhaps with cyclospora and protozoan parasites. In all of those, the contamination route we could see um, is probably going to be direct or indirect fecal contamination. Um, as Jim pointed out very well in his slides, um, there's potentially a lot of fecal contamination that occur. Any of these organisms might be present in fecal contamination. That really is the hazard, fecal contamination, which could contain any one of the microbiological hazards. So a generic hazard is fecal contamination. We don't really need to discriminate particularly between microbiological types. Um, it's fecal contamination that's going to be the issue. The issues we might face, where would that hazard come from? Uh, again, go back to Jim's slides. Irrigation water, maybe harvesting conditions, sanitary practices in the field, worker hygiene, storage conditions after harvest. Any one of these could introduce contamination uh, in, into, the, uh, into the product. And we should then be able to identify production stages where fecal contamination could occur. Where could fecal contamination come in at each of these points? Exposure assessment um, would be the next stage. Does contamination of a significant amount actually occur? We could consider any routes of contamination as an issue. Um, if we find there are multiple routes of contamination, as I pointed out in the last slide, we would look at developing a separate exposure assessment for each of those routes. And then we can classify them. And this classification table that we've used within, uh, within the ULSA group is one that was developed in, in, a, in a source by WHO, and it's certainly used in the UK by the Food Standards Agency to design, define uh, exposure to, uh, to particular, particular hazards. And it goes from negligible, which is so rare it's not, uh, not going to be considered, up to very high events will occur with, with great certainty. And we can categorize uh, our exposure using this particular type of table, which is useful for us as we move forwards. The intervention assessment is really the assessment of the efficacy of any intervention at lowering the exposure to the hazard. So looking at that, um, we can assess the efficacy of an intervention. Um, now, the intervention assessment we could do quantitatively if we had quantitative information. And the example is on that slide. If, for example, we were looking at water and we were employing some form of water filter that we knew removed a particular level of a microorganism, and we had validation data to show that, that would be a quantitative approach to assessing the efficacy of that intervention. We may, in many cases, not have that. We might have a qualitative uh, assessment, and that might be through an expert opinion. Somebody would have knowledge that that was likely to happen if you did that, and that might be in a published paper. We should then look at categorizing the efficacy of the intervention. And by doing that, we, we actually categorized in two forms. Um, one we called effective and effective uh, efficacy, um, which we would uh, categorize or, or uh, um, uh, define as a validated reduction. So if we had validation information that showed a known validated reduction of the hazard, that would be an effective intervention. If we didn't, if we had more of a qualitative approach and expert opinion, uh, that would be a partially effective, not a fully effective intervention. Non-validated, the exposure to the risk may not be reduced to negligible levels. So we have two different categories of efficacy of intervention. And of course, in any system, we might be able to use or we might see single or multiple interventions that might be present. Then after considering what those interventions are, we can then assess whether that intervention has been effective. And we then move on to this slide. And on this slide, we have uh, on, the, on the first column on the left-hand side, uh, the probability of significance of contamination before the intervention. And that runs down our, our list of negligible through to very high. 
And across the top, on the, uh, the row on the top, we have the effectiveness of the intervention. And on the left-hand side, we have an effective intervention, then we have a partial, then we have no intervention at all. And this tells us whether the intervention has been acceptable or not, or whether we need to take further action. So if we took something that was um, a, medium, um, a medium significance of contamination beforehand, uh, and we moved across and we used an effective intervention measure, that would become acceptable and we could use it. And we would say that the hazard had been effectively dealt with. If that intervention was only partial, um, if it was an expert opinion that we had some, uh, some reduction in the hazard, um, that would only be a partial uh, effective intervention, and we'd need to take further action. You see medium in the middle, we'd have to, I'd have to take further action uh, to uh, uh, mitigate the, the hazard that we'd identified. Just uh, slide. The next couple of slides, uh, the final ones I've got, really look at an example of how that particular system could be put into place. Um, the example we picked, and, and it's in a publication I'll show you afterwards, um, would be irrigation water being used to irrigate our leafy fallow crop. And in our example, uh, the irrigation water would be open water with no treatment. So it's an open uh, groundwater style irrigation. Um, we go through the hazard identification, and again, we'd say, uh, again, looking at Jim's slides, it's fecal contamination, which could bring with it a whole range of different uh, microbiological hazards. Their exposure assessment, uh, we would say, would be medium. As you see it in red in the, in the, uh, the box there, it occurs regularly. The evidence that we've got for that, and the, the grower in this case will go back through testing that I've done on a water testing program, uh, maybe over the pre previous five years, and they might be seeing regularly that E. coli had been detected at various levels in their water. And that would give this medium level category with a definition of occurs regularly. It shows that fecal contamination probably occurs quite regularly. We then go forward and say, well, what about the intervention assessment? Um, let's categorize the efficacy. Um, is it effective? Is it a validated reduction? Or is it partially effective, a non-validated exposure? Well, the interventions we would then think about using, or we could think about using, um, well, we could say, well, let's look at ways in which we can prevent uh, the irrigation water from making contact with the leaf. Uh, and that might be instead of using spray irrigation, we'd use some sort of drip tape, some soil-based drip tape um, to put the, the water more directly in contact with the soil rather than touching the leaves. Um, evidence for that, uh, we've got various publications that would say, well, you avoid contact with the leaf surface. Um, but the issue might be you still get some soil splash um, with contaminated soil onto the leaf. So you've got to say that contamination using that approach could still occur with uh, what we know to be a, a contaminated irrigation water. We could look, in at, look at stopping irrigation uh, a number of days before the harvest. Um, evidence there would say that we would know through various publications that bacteria on leaf surfaces will decline over time in warm conditions. But there are also evidence from other publications that would say but bacteria can persist potentially quite longer times in cooler conditions. So again, we have a, an approach in which contamination should, could still occur. And if we look at then at our uh, effectiveness of intervention table on that slide, uh, we have the medium there, and if we move across to partial interventions, we still have further action required. It's not a fully effective intervention that we've used. So what have we got? Well, potentially using drip tape and using uh, a, a lengthy period between uh, irrigation and harvest, we've got two partial interventions. How can we assess it? Well, there's no evidence that we've got reduction in that case. So what are the ways forwards? Well, we could go on to say, well, in that case, we'll simply look at monitoring the water or monitoring the, harvest, uh, the harvested crop for E. coli as a hygiene criteria uh, and work forwards in that way just simply by a testing-based approach. Or perhaps better, we could use, uh, look at using uh, changing the water source. 
or putting in a more effective water treatment. And if we put in a more effective validated water treatment, for example, um, by UV treating the irrigation water, we might come up with a, a validated approach that is fully effective as an intervention strategy and, um, and, and, and give us a, a, a much better approach to reducing the hazard. So, the question that Jim raised, is this risk assessment or is it an assessment of risk? Well, we felt that using this type of approach, it was relatively easy to use. It allowed growers to use their own information in order to inform the assessment that they were actually doing. It uses information sources that should be readily available to people uh, through, through publicly available uh, information. It is an effective way of documenting the hazards and the, the potential exposure and allows the documentation of the effect of the interventions. And by documenting that, it's easy to see why particular decisions have been made when that assessment of risk was done. And therefore, it does provide a, a, a evidence of a, a clear assessment of risks associated with primary produce and the effectiveness of the intervention strategies that have been employed. Now, the group at ILSI, uh, when we've done that, we've, we've published that as a, as a paper in the Journal of Food Protection, which uh, is an open access paper. Um, it contains not only the examples I've given, but certainly one or two others, and describes more fully the ways in which that particular procedure could be used as a simple approach for primary producers of leafy products to assess the risk uh, during uh, growth of their products. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much uh, um, again, Roy. Uh, thank you also, Jim, for uh, these uh, presentations and uh, for the, the nice uh, follow-up from the first presentation to the second presentation. And uh, it will also go smoothly to the next presentation. Uh, um, and uh, I would also like to, re uh, to remind that you can post questions. The amount of questions getting in is, uh, is very nice. Uh, so it's uh, not 200, but uh, there's already some, some like 20. So it's going very well. Go on uh, with posing questions also for the former speakers, but also for the next speaker, that is Michel Daneluk. And uh, Michel is Associate Professor of Food Safety and Microbiology at the University of Florida. And her research focuses on uh, mainly on salmonella in produce and nuts, uh, uh, but along also with uh, produce products and processing environments. And she will now continue the presentation uh, about assessment of the risk and really see how it will go in the field. Please go ahead, Michelle. Michelle, are you still connected? Yes, I was speaking on mute. Marcel, I apologize. We okay. practiced and I screwed up. Anyway, um, I would like to start by thanking Ilse Europe for uh, organizing this and Marcel and IFP for having me. And thanks to Roy and Jim for setting the stage perfectly for my talk. I think their paper is a great starting point, very well written and very timely um, for what's happening in the produce industry. Uh, as Roy said earlier, why are growers doing a risk assessment? Well, this is a terminology that they've been used, and like, like uh, Roy said, someone is asking them to do it. Someone is asking them uh, to do a risk assessment, and this terminology is sort of continued throughout the industry, but when they, and they being the produce industry in this case, says risk assessment, is that what they really mean? And that's sort of the question I want to explore a little bit uh, in my talk. Um, because I think when they say the term risk assessment, that gives all of us an idea in our minds of what they're speaking about. Um, and perhaps we need to communicate better between the produce industry uh, and those of us in food safety as to get at what they really mean uh, to make sure that our produce is safe and we can mitigate risks in the field. So I want to start my presentation by introducing everybody to Carl. Carl is a farmer that I work with here in the state of Florida. He grows strawberries on about 150 acres and other fruits and vegetables as well, and he's been farming since 1974. Carl attends our food safety trainings regularly at the University of Florida. He sits in the front row. He's always attentive. He answers questions, and I think he really gets why food safety, especially for his produce, is important. He's great to work with. He believes and participates in re research, always glad to have us out on his farm. Um, and I know the paper that uh, 
Roy spoke to uh, and the examples that Jim gave early on were all had to do with leafy greens. But when we think about asking for a grower or a farmer to do a risk assessment, I want you guys to think about someone like Carl. This is who we're asking to do that assessment uh, out there in the field. And I briefly want to contrast that to the fact that we don't ask all manufactured food companies to do a risk assessment. And this is a picture of Pardeep. She's a former PhD student of mine and is now a food safety director for a medium-sized food company in Florida. She's got a large QA team working with her. She has a PhD in food science. Many members of her team have, have degrees or background experience in food safety. And yet we don't ask them or the industry doesn't ask them or their audit schemes don't ask them to do a, do a risk assessment. Instead, what we offer them is that they have to use HACCP principles or now under FISMA in the United States set up a food safety preventive controls plan, but we don't specifically talk to them about risk assessment. So when we talk about doing a risk assessment, and as sort of the point I want everyone to remember as we go forward, is that we're asking Carl, a farmer, who typically has no formal education in food safety to do a risk assessment, but we're not asking those in, in food manufacturing industry, even though they do have a formal education in food, food safety. And, and I want to explore why, why we're asking these questions. So the reality is that for years and maybe even decades, the produce industry has, has misused the word risk assessment. So before the IAFP annual meeting back in July uh, this year, I posed this question, what does the produce industry mean when they say risk assessment to 23 different people involved in the industry? And I got back 16 different answers within a day or two. Um, and of those answers, most of them are very telling. Um, and this was about two months after the, the paper release of the, the paper that, that Jim and Roy just spoke about. And I was wondering if any of the people were going to bring up that paper so we could have dialogue around it. And, and, and there wasn't. Um, and I thought that was very interesting. And so again, it's another reason I'm glad so many of you are on the line today and we can, we can talk about, about this very important issue. Um, of, of the people who responded, a number of them fell into the I would never tell a grower to do a risk assessment category. Some commented they're not equipped to do that. Um, and instead, they suggested that what that industry actually does is a hazard analysis. And that when somebody says in the produce industry to do a risk assessment, what they really mean is to do a hazard an uh, analysis. And five more of them shown here uh, also fell into this category, although these folks didn't do or didn't say they would never tell a grower to do that. They said, we know we're telling growers to do a risk assessment, but what we really mean by this is a hazard analysis and that the term is very much misused within the produce industry. Um, of the eight, or of the remaining answers, uh, eight, which is, was about half of the responses I got back, uh, fell into a category of, of telling me what they would do. Uh, and in general, these are folks who work with or in the industry and felt really strongly about what they meant when they say do a risk assessment. They have a good idea uh, about what they're trying to get a grower to do, even if it doesn't fit some of those definitions of risk assessment that, that um, have been formally presented um, before. And, and these folks often spoke to audit guidelines or pointing someone towards commodity-specific guidelines, uh, and, and more recently for those folks in the U.S., pointing them towards uh, guidelines, not only commodity-specific guidelines, but guidelines within the, the new produce safety rule here. And when we dive deep uh, into some of those, those audit schemes or guidelines they're pointing at, you see the term risk assessment numerous times. Um, and, and while the definition of what they, what maybe they mean by risk assessment it is vague, the activities that they describe are usually very beneficial towards food safety. So immediately before the IAFP meeting, I was having lunch with a friend of mine uh, who works in the industry, and she was talking about the pre-harvest risk assessment and global gap. Now, in my mind, I automatically translated pre-harvest risk assessment to pre-harvest inspection to look and see if there are any ob obvious points of, of hazard introduction, like those fecal contaminants um, that Roy previously spoke about. Um, say, wildlife poo uh, in a field, and that if they're there, they're identified so the hazard is not uh, harvested in that area. But I pressed the point with her of is this really truly a risk assessment? 
And our response was, was quite simple and I think quite meaningful. Um, I don't care what they call it, it makes a difference. And I suppose that really is the point, that whether these activities, assessment of risk or risk assessment growers are doing in the field, um, whatever they're doing or what they are doing, identifying hazards is making the product safer. And I think that's the overall goal for all of us. And this goes just beyond the global gap example I used um, before. There's a bunch of different schemes where they all talk about risk assessment uh, in them. And they typically talk about risk assessment followed by appropriate corrective actions to minimize identified hazards. And I really like this quote out of the paper that's been talked about before um, because I think it does a very good job in describing this practice as it applies in the field. Um, and I think it says it in words that most growers can understand. So let's go back to Carl. This is uh, Carl's strawberry field or one of his many strawberry fields. Again, he, he follows a lot of the practices Jim mentioned when he talked about irrigation water recently to reduce risks. He grows his strawberries on raised beds. The beds are covered in plastic and the drip tape is beneath the plastic. So there's very little potential for contact between that harvesting water um, or that irrigation water and the product that's, that's harvested. During our strawberry season, the harvesters come into the field every few days to pick uh, the ripe berries as they're present in the field. When they harvest them, they harvest them directly into plastic camshells that they then fit into pla uh, flats. It's all harvested by hand. They typically wear gloves and are trained extensively in health hygiene and food safety and know, how to har and know not to harvest fruit uh, with visible signs of, of wildlife droppings or that visible fecal contamination. They're also trained, however, on a number of other things uh, in quality areas to ensure that the product they're picking is of high quality and can get the shelf life required for their product. So we need to remember that even for these growers, their jobs go well beyond just food safety. Once the berries are packed, they go, the flats go into coolers and then they're distributed and directly to retail stores in these uh, flats uh, and these clamshells go directly into consumer fridges. So, you know, a formal risk assessment here um, may not be necessary to know that these harvest workers are a critical point in ensuring the food safety of Carl's strategies. And instead of maybe saying to Carl, you need to do a risk assessment on your harvest, perhaps we as a food safety committee need to do a better job and would better serve him um, by answering the question that my colleague Trevor Cecil so eloquently states, just tell me what to do, when to do it, how often and, and how to respond. Maybe we should let Carl worry about all the inputs into growing his berries and do a better job of just giving him a checklist or, or some sort of a list of what he needs to do uh, in his specific operation. Um, so Carl is a relatively simple example. They're field packing strawberries and things for me always get a bit more complicated when we move into a packing house situation. You've almost moved into a quasi-food processing situation, and that makes things a little bit more uh, difficult. Uh, and again, we typically don't see large food safety teams in those sort of packing houses. So here in this example of a response I got from somebody who I asked, what do you mean when you tell the produce industry to do a risk assessment, um, they shed a little bit of, of, of light onto, again, seeing examples that we in food safety or we from the food safety world might actually read um, as doing a hazard analysis. And, and I use this example in particular because the second paragraph on there um, really speaks to hesitancy in terms of not them themselves, and this is a, an, an instructor, um, not knowing how to do a proper risk prioritization. And I, I think that's a really important point is that we need some better tools to help growers and packers prioritize risks because it's really easy for us in academic circles to say it's complicated and it depends, but that's not always that helpful when we move into the field. Um, and, and here's an example of that. I think a lot of us who spend a lot of time in the field, um, out in the produce industry, can give a number, number of examples of what we would call a risk assessment gone wrong, and this is one of those examples. Um, in this example, it's a packing table that's made of of wood and is painted blue. Now, if you saw me speak on a presentation similar to this at IAFP, I said that the um, 
bottom or the bum of the person in the top left corner is my colleague Keith Schneider. Keith Schneider uh, was falsely accused by me. That is not him. It's actually a regulator from the state of Florida sitting on that table. And I need to formally apologize uh, to Keith. Keith. Um, but in this case, it doesn't uh, change the fact that we've still got a wood packing table and that the result of an auditor coming in and saying, look, my risk assessment of this situation tells me that you can't pack on a wooden table, you have to do something to cover that table with something else. And so as a result, the grower in this case covered half the table with a rough textured plastic material that as you can see from the visible debris on it is not easy to clean and sanitize. And I sort of ask you the question, did the response to this, this risk assessment done by the grower really make the packing environment safer? And I would, I would say no because it's, I would say, very challenging to clean this new surface they did put down and now are currently packing on. Um, when we look again at answers um, to my question, what do you mean when you, when you say do a risk assessment? Uh, this answer specifically brought up at looking at places that hazards can be introduced. So again, looking very similar to a, a hazard analysis or an assessment of risk. Um, and in some points, pointing out simple fixes or controls. They mentioned some important factors here that I think have been mentioned in the two previous talks before me. People uh, as a source of contamination in the environment, water or animals as a source of contamination, and, and food contact surfaces. Um, very much looking at the risk uh, of the operator. But even with directions like this, we can still see events where very basic food hygiene principles aren't being met. And so what I want you to look at in this picture here, this is a picture of a hand washing station out in the field where produce is being harvested, uh, and there's no evidence of soap ever being in this soap dis dispenser. Um, so we, we have a situation where really everything points to the grower or the harvest crew should know there should be soap here for someone to wash their hands with, and yet, yet it's not present there. And when we do grower trainings, and we've been doing a lot of Produce Safety Alliance grower trainings in terms of what is going on uh, right now in the U.S. with the new produce safety rule, we actually overheard this from a grower participant after our, our health and hygiene module. Uh, where they said, if I wash my hands every time you think I should wash my hands, all I do is stand at the sink all day washing my hands. Um, so we're getting still pushback from some growers on these basic hygiene principles. And you know what they're saying is probably right. If they did wash their hands every time I said they should wash their hands, they'd probably stand at the sink for a lot longer than they are standing at now. But again, it might have a significant risk uh, at making food safer. But I think that putting a grower like this in a situation where they might be ranking risks doing a risk assessment uh, might, might be a challenging situation for the grower uh, in particular. Um, so a couple more, there's three different examples of answers I got back. Uh, one of the statements that I really like here is sort of the, the um, second sentence or third sentence in that top answer. Um, look for the hazards that might occur in the operation. That's the risk assessment. And that's the answer, of course, I got from this person in the produce industry. And it doesn't meet the definition of a risk assessment as, as discussed previously, but it is assessing the hazards and looking for a way to mitigate and control them. And so it's making the produce safer and, and having an impact, even if it isn't that, that formal risk assessment that we might be looking for. And I offer two examples here. Uh, on the left, what we've got is a hole in a packing house roof, and on the right, there is rat poison uh, on the floor of a packing house. And I think any one of us on this call right now could look at those two different pictures and realize that they're likely introducing risks into that packing environment. Um, and, and we know that we should try to mitigate those with risks as much as we can. And we really, for a lot of growers who are out there packing product, again, a, a simple checklist or simple principles that they can follow to know that they, sh they should mitigate strategies like this are probably uh, what they need. Um, so I'm getting towards the end of my talk here. Uh, talking about what the produce industry means when they say risk assessment. But I really like this answer because it, it sort of gets at that complex issue of prioritizing risks that I think the paper that, that Roy and Jim both spoke to also really gets at. And, and it's a complicated situation 
to explain to a grower. Uh, and especially growers, like they said, and, and like I've mentioned, like Carl, who maybe don't have a formal background in food safety. And I've got another example of this. So this is a banana uh, float tank or dump tank, and it's being used to clean the hands of bananas. The grower recognizes that there's a tremendous potential for cross-contamination here uh, in this dump tank setup. So they've decided to add chlorine to the water to minimize the potential for cross-contamination. And they monitor that chlorine with the test strips on the right. And so if you haven't noticed what the problem with those test strips are, is that these are test strips to monitor total not free chlorine. And it's only the free chlorine that can prevent cross-contamination. And based on what they're measuring, the grower actually has no way of knowing if there's any free chlorine present in that recirculated water that's only changed out once a day that all those bananas pass through. Um, if there is actually any control of cross-contamination in there. So in this case, this is an example of the grower trying to do the right thing, but really missing the mark. And the scary part is, is that this grower's self-risk assessments to meet their audit schemes, and the auditor came, who came in to do audits over a number of years missed the fact that they were using the wrong sort of test strips. Um, so I don't care if we call this a risk assessment or the grower continues to call it a risk assessment, if we call it an assessment of risk. But stuff like this can't be missed by us as an industry. It's, it's too important, the prevention of cross-contamination like this. It's too important um, to miss. So as I wrap up, I want to bring us sort of back to the question at hand, and, and that brings me towards the produce safety rule here in the United States, which is the focus of a lot of our produce safety uh, training right now. And the produce safety rule itself doesn't define a risk assessment. But the Produce Safety Alliance, which uh, has a standardized um, curricula um, that we teach our growers with, which does, and this is the um, the, the definition there. Um, and from what I heard from what a, the produce industry says about what they're doing, when, what they mean when they say do a risk assessment, it really is closer to a hazard analysis or an assessment of risk than a, the risk assessment, but it is also still making a difference. So with that, I'll uh, bring us to my final slide. Um, just to bring out the point that there's a miscommunication, I think, between the produce industry and the rest of us when we talk about doing a risk assessment, uh, and that I think we need better communication and better understanding on both sides um, to talk about this. And I think the paper that Jim and Roy have talked about is a great starting point for this discussion. Um, and I'd also like to say that I don't think formal risk assessments should be the expectation for any individual grower on any individual farm. Um, I think risk assessments or formal risk assessments should be done on a commodity or industry-wide scale. And then we can provide the growers that the, the information they need to answer those simple questions. What do I need to do? How often do I need to do it? Where do I need to do it? And how do I need to respond when something goes wrong? And at the higher level, those risk assessments uh, can then help with the assessment of risk for each grower. Thanks, Marcel. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jim, Roy, and Michelle. And uh, uh, like I did also at the former uh, webinar, I will give now the applause. You should realize that uh, your audience was about uh, 350 people. So you can, of course, not uh, hear now the applause of all the 350 people. But on behalf of them, I give the applause for the three pres presenters for uh, this presentation and also for keeping nicely to the time. But I would also like to congratulate the audience because they also followed my advice. They did send questions and that were not too and at 50 and neither it were three and there were about uh, uh, 20 questions so that is exactly uh, what we are able to handle in the next say 10 minutes uh, and uh, for uh, for that uh, I am going to the to the first question um, and can maybe Hannah from IFB make that I can draw So the first question, uh, of course, I will not uh, go to Michelle because she has just done the last, uh, the last part. But the first question is focused to the first presenter, to Jim. And uh, some of the questions, of course, were posed already at the beginning um, and maybe came, became a little bit later, but the question was still posed. Could you please define, explain the tick box, tick box approach? So please do not 
do the question the answers too long because uh, we have a couple of questions to go on but Jim please could you uh, define explain the tick box approach okay a tick box approach would be uh, a way we describe a situation where a grower says I have to do in the example we used was uh, E. coli, generic E. coli sampling. They've been told they need to test their water, for example, every five weeks. So they test it every five weeks. Tick the box. Okay, I've done that task. It's not they've said, I have to do this, and I'm going to use it to my best advantage. So that's what we mean by tick box. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the next question is uh, going to uh, to Roy, uh, and uh, the question is: Are you suggesting a generic hazard and a hazard plan or food safety plan? It is, is it not uh, is, it, is it not important to only specify specific hazards in such plans? Uh, do we need justification, and not all fecal contaminants are hazards? So uh, we we focused uh, mainly on um, yeah, uh, fecal contamination. So are we are you really suggesting a generic hazard and the hazard and not look specifically? Uh, well, the answer is is um, not at all. Um, I think the the uh, examples that were given in the presentation are exactly that. They're examples. Uh, in in that instance, you could look at. Uh, the microbiological hazards uh, that could be identified on a, on a leafy product and say that predominantly those were going to come from, from um, a fecal source, uh, human or animal originally. Um, but it's certainly not a generic approach. Um, I think everyone that, that undertakes that type of assessment of risk would look at their own situation and define their own hazards particularly. And, you know, people might find... Uh, a hazard, they, they fit into a higher level with a particular hazard than other people because of their location. Um, but it's not a generic approach. It has to be tailored to an individual. Um, that was an example that was given in the, in the paper to, to show what could be, could be done and how you could group things together. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a problem, but my, uh, my my computer is not uh, I'm not able to to control the put the questions on the on the screen, uh, so I have to read out the question. Uh, the next question is uh, again to Roy, and maybe it can be a very short answer. Uh, on your slide 35, uh, there was a list of uh, contamination sources, and uh, one of the uh, audience said, "I would like to add manure as a contamination source." Um, I, I haven't got my slides actually listed, so slide 35 is, is unknown to me. But I think we said fecal contamination, and I think manure is fecal contamination, so I think it might be there. Yeah. And I think also in the, in the pictures that the Jim at the beginning showed, it was also, also present. Um, and then a next question also to Roy is, uh, how about the risk of listeria contamination from, for instance, soil? Yeah, I, I mean, again, it was an example uh, example that was given. Um, uh, obviously, listeria, uh, you can find listeria in soils, uh, and it has been linked to large outbreaks from fresh produce uh, in a number, of, a number of areas. So, yeah, you could actually add listeria there if, if you wished, if you felt it was a hazard in your particular product type. Um, so I think you, you could add that into there if, uh, if, if you wanted to and you felt that was a risk in your particular product. Um, so it's really up to the individual to look more widely at what fits the product that they've got um, and, and, and raise their hazards uh, accordingly. And uh, now I would like to change to Michelle because uh, she has been able to breathe for a couple of minutes now, so she has air again. And uh, um, and then and then also uh, because uh, you have to realize I'm sitting in the Netherlands, um, uh, Bill is sitting in Belgium, Roy is sitting in the UK, and Michelle is in Florida. And this question is uh, very uh, yeah. Uh, Timely question: uh, Are there bi bacteriological samples taken after a heavy rain event, such as a hurricane, uh, causing unusual runoffs? And uh, 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 of course, Michelle has just uh, had uh, an experience in this aspect. Yeah, thanks, Marcel. Um, that's a, an excellent question. Um, you know, certainly uh, in the United States, anyway, if produce is touched by flood water, it's considered adulterated. Um, so, an extremely 
uh, heavy rain events when situations are where we get flood water in the field overflowing from an open water source. Certainly any of that produce would be considered adulterated and would not enter the food chain. Um, if anybody can figure out the best way to test irrigation water and what the right standards would be, I think uh, should win a, a big prize. I'm not sure what that prize would be, but it should be a big prize. Um, you know, the influence of rainfall, um, heavy rainfalls on, on E. coli counts and the quality of water um, is certainly influenced by a lot of factors that, that are hard to define on a worldwide stage. Uh, certainly in some areas where there would be runoff from, say, a animal production, the counts could go up. In other areas, you could have dilution effect where that heavy rain actually dilutes any contamination in the water. It's a really complicated situation that would need to be evaluated based on the type of irrigation water source in play. Okay, and then uh, yeah, so some some of the questions can of course be uh, a question to uh, the, all the, the presenters, uh, but I will now move to to Jim. Uh, and is the is there a realistic expectation that fresh pro fresh producers across the world do and will continue to have access to expert opinion to assist with the assessment framework? That's an interesting question. Um, what we see increasingly is where they're required to follow food safety management systems or GAP programs and the like, there is a central process um, where that is being monitored. I wonder whether that might be the, uh, a clear route for trying to get this information out. And you see that with Global GAP. You see it in the UK with Red Tractor. Um, you see it in the States where um, growers are being supported and uh, to try to understand how best to assess risks, but also at the same time to give examples of best practice. Okay. Um, so and then um, the next question, uh, maybe also to Jim, but also maybe to Roy or to Michelle. Should the grower not only think of interventions, but also of preventive actions, like no production of leafy greens on mixed farms? Um, well, Jim answering here. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, a preventive action is, is is a response to the evidence in front of you. If if it is too risky to be growing uh, a crop such as a leafy green um, on uh, a mixed farm, uh, then maybe stop growing it. Uh, traditionally, a few, you know, maybe 10, 20 years ago, that sort of practice might have occurred in some places. We have changed the way we grow crops. You see much less use of um, animal manures in leafy crop production now than maybe 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, then uh, a question to uh, Roy in this case. Uh, dripping instead of spraying also contributes to a lower use of water. It's, I think, more a remark, but may, uh, I, I, I think I would agree with this, uh, with this remark. Uh, do you have any additional comments on that, Roy? No, it's obviously it, it's it's correct, and and um, in it, it it does have a, a much lower water usage. Um, I, I think it's the, the the whole area about the way you irrigate is is a very important one, and and um, uh, I I live in a very agricultural area, and mostly it is spray irrigated from from small farm reservoirs, uh, and you do look at that and the amount of birds that are around in the area and so on, and you do uh, I guess get concerned about the level of contamination that may be going on from spray irrigation. Drip irrigation, good way around it. It does save water in that sense. Um, it may have some other advantages. It may have some disadvantages. But I think it's, it's a very good consideration um, for both water usage and, and reducing the uh, external contamination of crops. Okay, then uh, back, back to Michel. Uh, what are the microbiological targets for irrigation water and fresh produce which will not be cooked? It's not an Sorry, easy Marcel, what was the end of the question? Which will not be what? Cooked. Cooked. So what um, are the microbiological targets for him? 
That's an excellent question uh, that, that will take me a long time uh, to answer. And I encourage whoever sent that question to send me an email. And uh, certainly in the United States, the FDA is currently trying to assess those numbers and figure out what appropriate uh, numbers are in terms of E. coli levels in water. It's more complicated than just E. coli levels in water because you need to think about not only what those levels are, uh, how you monitor those levels over time, how you collect samples for those to, to to how, what test methods you use when you collect those samples, how frequently you collect those samples, where in a complex irrigation stream those might be collected from. Uh, FDA has proposed some numbers in their final uh, rule, which uh, require a geometric mean of 126 E. coli per 100 mils and a statistical threshold value of 410 uh, taken from 20 water samples in an open water source uh, or, for, or from four water samples in a, in a well water um, source. If those numbers are right or not, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly other industries like the tomato industry here in Florida has decided that for any crop contact or any tomato contact water uh, in our Tgaps regulations, there can be no detectable generic E. coli in 100 mils of water. So it's a, it varies by industry and certainly I would say at this point there is not one universal standard worldwide and I'm not sure if we'll ever get to a point where there is one universal standard worldwide because a lot of factors go into those numbers. And then a question related to this, uh, and that I would like to pose to Roy, but also can also intervene, is uh, how should the microbial variability in surface water be handled by the growers? Because uh, we can set those limits that Michelle has just been talking about, but then uh, there is a lot of variability. How can this be handled? Again, not an easy question. It isn't. Um, and I mean, the first thing you, you, you have to, to look at is, well, what degree of variability would you find? And I, um, I don't really know, and maybe um, Michelle or, or Jim could, could come in on that. Um, I'm not sure how much testing of irrigation waters is actually routinely done to understand the level of variability you get in waters. Um, and it will depend, obviously, on the water source, and it will probably depend on the, on the time of year. Um, but controlling it is, is probably not something you can easily do without using something like a, a full intervention measure like UV treatment. Um, otherwise, you're left with looking at other measures to control it. But I don't know whether Michelle or Jim could comment on the, the type of variability you might see according to time of year yep. or irrigation water source. I'm, I'm happy just to, to talk to that as well. Uh, I would say that this actually takes us down this, this track almost towards a tick mist again, because what is your water testing telling you? If you're testing for generic E. coli, you're not testing for pathogens. You're testing to see whether there is fecal contamination of your water source, which means that there may be um, a risk of other um, bacterial uh, species being present that could be an issue. And so this is the challenge where actually you need to understand the pattern of your own water sources. You need to see those, those trends over time. Uh, it's not a, uh, a, a guarantee to prevent problems. It's a way to understand how to manage your water source. Okay, and then uh, a next question uh, that uh, maybe can also be asked by Jim because he has now the, the floor, uh, but it's also a question that this can be answered by everyone. Uh, but in a qualitative framework, it seems that the key question is whether a hazard was reduced enough. Uh, this is, and this is, of course, a soft issue uh, because some level of control is needed, but how far do, should we go uh, in order to have, as a grower, to have enough confidence that your hazard is enoughly, enough uh, reduced? So is there a way to provide assurance of enough control using a qualitative approach? Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, that depends on what is the acceptable level of risk. And I think uh, as time goes forward, we see that from a consumer and a customer perspective, the acceptable level of risk is declining. Um, and that actually turns this whole topic on its head, which is how do we educate the customers about the fact that there is some risk with products that are not cooked. 
Okay, and then an, uh, a question again to everyone, but I will give this now to Michelle. How do we keep the growers thinking beyond checklists? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and certainly I think the way that we, everybody would like a checklist. Checklist makes things really easy in terms of food safety. And I think there are certain things we can do or give growers on a checklist that, that will make their product safer. But a checklist alone or a checklist-based approach alone won't achieve um, sort of that level of safety that the consumers are, are, are looking towards. And so I think the way we need to do that is continuing education uh, with growers, continuing education, continuing dialogue continuing interactions with their commodity groups um, to let them know that, that food safety issues, even though there is a checklist, are not black and white. Um, and I think that that, that certainly is, is a challenge. I think as we continue to see more outbreaks, um, new types of pathogens, new sources of those pathogens, sort of keeping them on their toes and thinking about what might happen through continuing education is a key way to do that. So we uh, are going now towards the end of the of the questions. The, there, are an, an, uh, during the questions again, some uh, new questions came came in. So uh, thanks again for all these questions, but we can uh, not uh, handle at this webinar now all the questions. So um, I'm sorry for that, but we have to uh, go to rounding off of this uh, webinar. So uh, I would like uh, again to thank the speaker and then give the words to, again to Balan to finish off. Thank you, Marcel. Uh, I would like to very much thank you, uh, all the speakers of today, Dr. Jim Monaghan, Dr. Roy Betts, and Professor Michelle Danulik for their invaluable contribution to the presentations in this webinar. Thank you, Professor Marcel Fritterin, for the moderation of the webinar. Also, many thanks to the IFG staff that facilitated all technical details for, for this webinar. And of course, thank you to all participants that joined it today. Please do not forget to, to answer the survey that you will receive shortly by email. And I wish all of you a pleasant evening or day, depending where are you. And we are looking forward to having you again in the next webinar in due time. Thank you.